And welcome once again to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and discussing topical issues. And this week, we meet a first-time visitor to the set of The Verdict. Yes, uh, we have three law schools in Oklahoma, and we have not yet had the dean of the University of Tulsa Law School on, but we are today. Uh, dean Janet Levitt is going to be our guest, and we're really pleased she'd drive over here from Tulsa to join us, and we're looking forward to visiting with her. Absolutely. We'll learn more about her and what's going on at the University of Tulsa and their law school. It's all happening today right here on The Verdict. We'll be right back. Everyday America uses clean burning natural gas instead of coal or oil is a day of victory for our environment. That's why Chesapeake chose to explore for natural gas exclusively, and we've never looked back. Because natural gas burns twice as clean as oil or coal, and reducing carbon emissions to combat potential global warming is every bit as urgent as cutting our dependence on energy imports. As America's number one driller of new gas wells, Chesapeake is moving fast to find untapped reserves of natural gas here at home. It's the right fuel for America's economy and the fuel for a clean air future. We just happen to be early to see it so clearly. Chesapeake, natural gas wins the day. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. We are very pleased today to have Dean Janet Levitt, the University of Tulsa College of Law Dean, join us for the, her first visit. We're kind of uh, glad to get her on since we've had Dean from the other two law schools here in the state, but uh, Dean Levitt is uh, relatively new in her job, and we're pleased she'd join us. She uh, grew up in the Chicago area, did her undergraduate work at Princeton, got a, her law degree and a master's degree from uh, Yale University. Uh, is the first female dean at the University of Tulsa College of Law. Uh, she has had a varied experience uh, background. She's practiced law. She's been with the Import-Export Bank in Washington, D.C., been uh, at the University of Tulsa uh, two times, and this, uh, this time uh, she's now serving as dean. This is her first visit to the verdict. I hope not yeah. your last. I certainly hope it's not my last. Well, welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Well, just in general, the University of Tulsa's law school, tell us the numbers. How, uh, how does it affect the, the city and the university and, and, and what numbers would you, can you tell our audience that might not be as familiar about that school as they are others? Well, the University of Tulsa itself has undergone a dramatic transformation in the past 15 years. It's transformed itself from a commuter school to a top 100 university. And the University of Tulsa College of Law is really proud to be part of that process. Uh, right now we're graduating about 150 law students a year. Uh, some of them graduate in January, some of them in May. And um, we actually are shrinking those numbers just a bit as well. So we are going to be looking at a student body of about 400 students in the years to come. You're intentionally yes. shrinking. We are intentionally shrinking shrinking the College of Law um, as part of an effort to really increase the quality of our student body, but also to really 
uh, enhance one of our great strengths, which is our very low student-faculty ratio, our maintaining class sizes at a very small, intimate level. Uh, our first-year classes are about 50 students or less. Um, some law schools pack 100 or more into their first-year classes. Uh, so, and also just we have very strong mentoring relationships between our faculty and our students and we're just able to do a better job with less students. Dean, the last two guests we've had <clears throat> over the last four weeks, uh, uh, David Bourne and Burns Hargis, both had interesting uh, careers prior to coming to uh, their jobs uh, that they hold today. I think uh, you've had an in equally interesting career. Can you tell our viewers about what you've done prior to becoming Dean? Sure. Uh, well, I grew up, as you said, I grew up in Chicago, uh, the daughter of two amazing parents who valued education, taught me that it never hurts to be excellent and that you're never a failure as long as you try your best. Uh, so set my sights on um, Princeton and from a very young age and then from there went to Yale Law School where I met my husband, Ken Levitt. And, uh, who's been a guest on this who show. Who has been a guest on the show. And um, we left law school and moved to Tulsa, drove our, our U-Haul truck across uh, I-95, and both had clerkships, uh, judicial clerkships, which are just unbelievable opportunities for young law graduates to work with judges. I, I clerked for Judge Stephanie Seymour. At that time, she was the chief judge of the Tenth Circuit and has become a very dear friend and, and my most uh, important mentor. Uh, Ken clerked for Judge Terry Kern, who had just been appointed. Uh, and then we sat down with a yellow piece of paper, pro cons, stay in Tulsa, leave Tulsa. We had um, the opportunity to go to big law firms on the East Coast. And on the balance, it just seemed like Tulsa offered wonderful opportunities. Uh, went from being a professor, uh, taught criminal law, taught administrative law, and then some opportunities presented themselves in Washington, D.C. We moved there for a couple years, and I was an assistant general counsel at the Export-Import Bank, where I did a lot of international trade and finance work. Um, that international law and international business were my passions throughout my education and was able to pursue those at the Export-Import Bank in a very interesting manner. At that time, 1997, the, there was an Asian financial crisis, uh, probably not unlike the crisis that we're, that we're involved in right now, and putting together some pretty large facilities to try to work out of that crisis. Spent a little bit of time in the dot-com sector during the dot-com bubble as an associate general counsel for a company that was involved in uh, international trade finance as well. And then Ken and I decided we wanted to move back home, we moved back to Tulsa. Uh, I rejoined the faculty uh, where I taught international law, an international business course, and contracts. Describe the student body at, at the University of Tulsa. How would you say it differs? The student body is excellent and getting more excellent every year. We just enrolled 139 students. Um, the highest academic quality students, student body that we have enrolled thus far in the history, in the, in the recorded history that I can find of the University of Tulsa College of Law. Uh, about 50 percent women, 50 percent men, a little low, little uh, less women. Uh, and what's been really spectacular about our ability to increase the quality of our class is we've done it with being very attentive to maintaining a diverse student body. Um, we have about 25, 20 percent minority members of the first year cl class. The largest group is the Native American population and given that we are in Oklahoma, I'm very proud of that statistic. I noticed uh, <clears throat> looking at the end product uh, that you uh, graduate from the law school, one of the measures of the, of one among many measures of legal education would be a bar exam pass rate. University of Tulsa is doing quite well there. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we're very, very proud of our students. Um, on the last two of bar exams, our first time test takers, so those students who've just graduated have passed at a 93% pass rate. Uh, a few years ago, we were a bit lower than that, and we identified that as a problem, and I think we as a community brought our best problem-solving skills to bear on it. 
the faculty um, up the rigor of some of the required courses and also increase the number of required courses. Mm -hmm. The Alumni Association started to get very involved in mentoring students, especially those that we might have identified as at-risk students. Uh, the student body, the Student Bar Association, works with students in all classes to emphasize that commencement, while a great accomplishment, is not the end of, a league, of the law school education, that there is another big hurdle to cross. Um, so I think that, that our bar passage rate staying up in the low 90s um, is really fantastic and is really a testament to the hard work of faculty, students, staff, the bar, and the administration of the university. And those are all my constituencies, so I'm so proud yeah. of them. Yeah. The uh, University of Tulsa, of course, is a private institution, right. not a public institution. How does that affect either positively or negatively the law school? I think it affects it positively in, in, in many ways, but two primary ways. Uh, the first is some public schools, not all, but some uh, have to be relatively large um, or are large or have in-state admission requirements. And we are able to maintain a, a smaller, more intimate feel more intimate setting and I've already described how that really helps our students, our classroom experience and the overall student experience um, and I'm really proud of the intimacy that we've been able to develop. Second, I think not receiving state funding allows us to involve ourselves in legal issues which may be a little touchier um, for publicly funded institutions. So for example, one of those issues is immigration for us. We have an immigration clinic that our students are involved in political asylum cases and violence against women cases. And also with a grant from the George Kaiser Family Foundation, we've been able to expand our immigration clinic to help educate nonprofits around Tulsa to educate immigrants on what happens if they get a knock on the door one night. And I'm really, I'm really proud of that. Um, and it's, it's in, I think it's very important for Tulsa. Um, that there is a space where that community can go. Janet Levitt is the Dean at the University of Tulsa's Law School. You're watching The Verdict and we'll be right back. From the first grade on, I knew I wanted to be an artist. That's all I ever thought about. I approach it much different than the normal weaver in that I look at my warp yarns, which are your base yarns, as a palette that gives excitement to the cloth because you never know what you're gonna get. I'm sure it's something I feel, not something I talk about a lot, um, the spiritual aspect of it, but it is there, it's below the surface and it's guiding me. I feel very blessed to be a Chickasaw. I feel like I have just been given this heritage. It gives me a whole reason for doing the beadwork patterns in my weave structures. Seeing the Chickasaw tribe fostering art, using art, and how valuable it is to the tribe is inspirational. And the creative thought, you know, it's in business, it's in economics. It's, it's what gives us meaning, it's what gives us depth. It's what makes us see the beautiful of the world. Home values are down in some states, but not in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's home values have increased 4.2% during the past 12 months. Unlike some states where home values have decreased as much as 20%. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. There may be real estate problems in some states, but there has never been a better time than now to buy or sell a home in Oklahoma. One of the most affordable states in the country, Oklahomans are buying and selling homes every day. And an Oklahoma Realtor can show you how. Good thing you're in Oklahoma. Okiwani is an Indian name for a place where children play. When we obtained the camp, we found a lot of oil debris left in the woods. We saw a commercial about how the oil and natural gas industry cleans up old oil well sites. We called the OERB and they agreed to remove tons of concrete and steel. It didn't cost us a thing. Thousands of children have left their footprints on this land. Thanks to the oil and gas industry, they will for a long time to come.
Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. Kent, where do you want to go to now? We were talking uh, before the break about Tulsa being a private school, and I know that uh, tuition costs basically are probably higher there than they are at a state-supported school. Uh, is that a deterrent to the law school? Well, tuition at the University of Tulsa College of Law has a, da has a daunting price tag. It's $27,500 for a year. Um, but that should not be a deterrent to any student who wants to apply and um, go to the University of Tulsa College of Law. We are determined that every student who is excellent, who is decent, and who has the potential to be someone that any of us would want to call as our colleagues can go to the University of Tulsa College of Law um, irrespective of the tuition and we have we are very fortunate to have a pretty large endowment in place to support scholarships and essentially through those scholarships uh, we equalize tuition with the state supported schools or do better. We have 12 excellence in education scholarships that we give away every year which are full tuition, room, board, and some living wow. expenses. So I want to repeat for all those students <laughs> out there, um, anyone who's really determined to become a lawyer um, and wants to come to the University of Tulsa and is excellent, <clears throat> and has excellent qualifications, we will make it possible. You've been in your role about a year, is that right? Correct, correct. You've had an opportunity to kind of see what the position is like from the president's office or from the dean's office. Mm -hmm. What changes do you foresee long term that you'd like to implement in direction that you'd like to see the, the, the School of Law take? Well, the reality is that under the really enlightened leadership of Robert Butkin, who was my predecessor, the faculty in the school engaged in a long-range plan and identified three critical areas of improvement. And those are the areas that I'm going to focus on. So technically they're not changes, they're continuing a plan that was put in place. The first we've already talked about, student quality. Every year we have a plan to increase the student quality incrementally um, so that each year the students are just a little better than the students the year before. Uh, the second pillar of that plan is really enhancing the national reputation of our faculty. We have a wonderful faculty. We have a faculty member who is writing a book that has just been accepted by a really prestigious press on Iraqi oil law, oil and gas law. Mm. Um, we have another faculty member who is writing a book that's been also been accepted on commercial speech. We have faculty members who have articles accepted in the top 20 law journals in the country. What we haven't done a great job with is publicizing these accomplishments, and so we're doing some pure marketing that mm -hmm. most law schools around the country are engaged in. We're also being very, very uh, careful each time we hire um, to make sure that that hire is as excellent as possible. And then finally, we need to be very, very focused on the student experience, that those three years that the students are gonna spend at the College of Law and we're small, we can't be the excellent and the best in the country at everything we do, but we will be the most excellent program in energy law. That's what our students want, that's what they are demanding, um, and with the help of lots of support from the, our alumni community and also from private corporations like Chesapeake Corporation, a very important corporation here in Oklahoma City, we're developing just a first rate energy program. Uh, we will also be the best in the country in Native American law um, and particularly the intersection of energy law and Native American law. Um, and so those are the areas that we're really focusing a lot of resources on. We're also very excellent in health law, excellent um, in international law, particularly international law as it, as it dovetails with energy and with indigenous issues. Um, and we are just going to focus resources on those areas where students really um, have expressed interest and a desire to excel, and those are the areas. Let me ask you, <clears throat> you mentioned about the uh, male-female ratio in your incoming class. Ask, let me ask about the ratio of male-female uh, on the law school as a whole and then also on the faculty. 
Uh, as far as the students on the whole, we're probably right around, uh, because female applications dropped for, for a while, we're probably right around 45, 46 percent in our student body. And our, our all of our students are excellent. Um, our Women's Law Caucus is really an amazing group. They are now building a school for young girls in Cambodia. Um, that is one of, has been identified at education as one of the proven ways to keep those girls out of the slave trade, out of the sex trade. And so that's amazing. And they're an amazing group of women. Um, as far as the faculty, overall we're at 50 percent. 50 percent women, 50 percent men. Um, and as far as tenured faculty, we're at right about 46 percent. I believe that probably tenured faculty goes to you may be the highest percentage of women in the country. And quite frankly, really? I don't think I would have been in my job. I'm not sure I would have been hired if it wasn't for an incredibly dedicated, committed group of women faculty who actively sought out women to join the faculty and rise mm -hmm. through the ranks. What are the employment opportunities for, for lawyers in today's market? That is a good question, but it's a much better question to be asking in Oklahoma than on the coast right now. Um, we send, depending on the year, about 50 to 60 percent of our students stay within the, the, the general geographic area, so Oklahoma, Texas, Missouri, Kansas. And I think this offers all law schools in the area a real opportunity right now, because as we know, as, as we speak, um, the financial markets are collapsing, so those major law firms on the coast who would hire dozens of law students to support institutions like Lehman Brothers are no longer hiring those students. Um, what we're trying to do is not only place students in local law firms, which we're being very successful in doing, but also create pipelines into the energy industry. Um, and I, me I mentioned Chesapeake, uh, we have a Chesapeake Scholars Program, which essentially each year gives scholarships and summer employment opportunities to at least five TU students um, with the hope that those opportunities blossom into full-time employment opportunities. I'm actively pursuing other relationships like that because I think that in this current economy, some of these business opportunities um, in-house opportunities as well as law firm opportunities and private practice opportunities here are really going to help us create a strong niche for Oklahoma law schools. Come here. We still have a thriving, we still have a thriving industry and a thriving economy. You mentioned two or three areas that you think are uh, your law school's strengths. Mm -hmm. Do you have any areas that you have identified that you'd like to try to improve or increase your your uh, offerings? Yes, I, mean, I think that our students right now are really demanding what they would call skills opportunities. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I cringe at that term a bit because I feel like everything we teach our students is a type of skill, but what they're talking about is real practical skills. Um, you know, Ken, because you are a professor yourself <laughs> for us, that um, sometimes law can be theoretical sometimes it can feel like it's at a very high level and what the students want is some experience so that when they are unleashed and out practicing they they feel very comfortable and so we are increasing our clinical offerings uh, we're increasing for example uh, when I was teaching I taught a class that was contract negotiating and drafting class um, that was just based upon a series of contract negotiations. We are really encouraging more and more classes like that and have um, appointed a director of professional skills, mm -hmm. um, both in the litigation side and on the transactional side. And so we also have incorporated pro bono service into a lot of the extracurricular work that our students do, but even just orient during the orientation week, one of the four days is spent doing pro bono work at, with the nonprofit in Tulsa mm -hmm. that's geared towards legal work. Wow, this has been a fascinating show, and congratulations all the success that's going on the, on the TU campus and specifically with the School of Law. Well, thank you very much. You need much. to come back. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. I'll be back. Janet Levitt is the dean of the University of Tulsa's School of Law, and she has joined us here on The Verdict today, making her first appearance, and we hope not her last. Kent and I'll be back with a final word right after this.
The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers here to wrap up a show with the University of Tulsa's School of Law uh, Dean, uh, Janet Levitt. Yeah, Janet's a, a great lady and a quite uh, scholar in her, her own right and will do wonderful things at the mm -hmm. University of Tulsa. The law school's uh, making good progress and she'll enhance that progress. Their website, utulsa.edu, and our website, theverdict.tv. See you next week. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.